Good morning and welcome. I'm Matthias Roos. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of York, and I want to welcome you to today's event, which is part of York Festival of Ideas Online. Although in a different format, the festival continues to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation, offering the highest caliber of public events. The 2020 festival has over 60 online events offering an inspiring program for all ages. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy this adventure on which we are going to take you. Before we start, a few technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have technical issues, such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again. So, do you want to save the planet? Are you looking for easy, doable, down-to-earth ideas and suggestions? So join us and join Jen Gale, also of the Sustainable-ish Living Guide for some practical ideas on every aspect of our lives, from the things we buy and the food we eat, to how we travel, work, and celebrate. Find out how to change your impact without radically changing your own life and figure out small steps that you can take that will add up to make a big difference. Come along and discover how we fit sustainable living into your life, how we all can do this in ways that work for all of us. Jen Gale is a mom and ex-vet who once dragged the family along with a year buying nothing new, blogged about it and found her voice and her sink. The author of the Sustainable Living Guide, she now blogs, writes, and speaks and podcasts on all things sustainable. She believes we are not all helpless and that our actions are not insignificant. It all starts with that first step and continues one step at a time. Gently, over to you, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for that intro. It's bizarre listening to somebody else um, speak about you, but thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining um, us this morning from your living room or your kitchen or wherever you are. I hope everybody's got a cuppa. I've got my cup of tea here. If you do hear a bit of background noise, the kids are upstairs. They have been, um, you know, on pain of pain of no iPads to keep quiet. <laughs> um, so we'll see how we get on. Um, so welcome, I've got a um, PowerPoint with some slides and things for a presentation today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my own journey, um, the, the sort of reason why. I think it's important for lots of us to, um, to make some sustainable or sustainable-ish changes. Um, and hopefully it's going to be a kind of um, uh, action-packed in terms of actions and ideas that you can do um, so that you'll leave with, um, you know, with some real actionable points that you can take. Um, as Matthias said, there's, uh, there's the Q&A box there. So if you've got any questions, do answer them. Um, I will probably, and then Matthias is going to come back on at the end and I will do my best to answer them. Um, I probably won't look at them as we're going along because otherwise I'll get distracted and we'll be here for hours. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm aiming to get my bit of the presentation, the sort of talk bit done um, by about quarter two so that we'll have time for questions and things um, at the end. So I hope that's all right with everybody. Um, right, here we go with my screen share. Let's see if we can. So there's just a um, pretty little starter slide. Um, so, yeah, welcome. I said today we're going to have a brief review of the impact of the climate crisis, um, basically, as a bit of motivation for why we need to act. I don't know about you, but I find it, I try and avoid too much in the terms of um, sort of news coverage and stories about the climate crisis because I find it quite overwhelming, quite panic inducing. And when I'm feeling sort of overwhelmed and anxious, um, I find it much harder to act. So, um, but we are just gonna briefly touch on that as a bit of uh, motivation and a bit of a nudge to, um, to, to just sort of bring home the importance that we all act, that we all take action. And um, we're gonna explore that concept of sustainable-ish, um, 
and I, I love the ish. I think the ish makes everybody kind of makes it so much more relatable to people. And some of the barriers that maybe hold us back from making those positive changes that we kind of maybe think we should, but we just never seem to get around to. We're gonna to touch on the huge potential that we all have as individuals, as families to make a difference. And we're gonna look at some of the simple changes and swaps that we can all make today. So I hope that's all all right with everybody. So my story, I um, I had to write a bio for the book, which is really hard to write your own bio. And uh, but I came up with, you know, I'm an ordinary knackered mum of two. Um, so hopefully that's quite relatable to a lot of people. Um, and about eight years ago, I randomly decided we were going to spend a year buying nothing new. Um, quite a naive um, decision, just thought it would be a bit fun. Um, completely hadn't joined those dots at all between the things we bought and the things we were throwing away, the things we bought and the impact on the planet. Um, and remember, you know, this was, when was it, 2012, 13? So this was before we had Greta, before we had the climate strikes, before we had Blue Planet 2. So I think, um, you know, I was aware of, of climate change, as we called it then, um, but um, but it was, didn't have the same sort of media profile and, um, and that kind of thing. Um, but it was, uh, you know, a big cliche klaxon needs to go off. It was a completely life changing experience in that it not only changed um, sort of how and, and where I spend my money, but it also changed um, uh, how I see my place in the world. If that doesn't sound too grand and too worthy, it made me realize, you know, I distinctly remember about halfway through going, well, what am I doing? What is the point of this? Like these issues are huge. And what the hell, you know, uh, one person in a little rural town in Wiltshire, like, what are you going to do to make a difference? But actually by the end of the year, I realized that the only person's, um, uh, choices I can actually affect are my own you know the only person whose actions I have any control over are my own my kids do their very best to prove that to me every day so um do you know that that I have to take responsibility for those choices and um, and the impact of those choices and that's not to say that I make the right decision every single time the perfect decision that is very much not the case but um you know I think it's very much about making better decisions more of the time um so during that year I started a blog um as Matthias said, I, I used to be a vet, so I had a very scientific background. Um, I hadn't been able to sort of explore um, writing and things like that, but discovered that actually I really enjoyed writing, really enjoyed communicating what we were doing. Um, and during that year, built a, you know, a sort of online following. Um, and now I have this amazing online community, this sustainable-ish community of over 40,000 people all taking imperfect eco action. And that's, you know, it's really important that it doesn't, we're not looking for perfection. Um, had loads of amazing opportunities come out of that that year buying nothing new um, was asked to speak at a TEDx event and obviously I'm here today talking to you because um, I've written my first book the sustainable living guide which came out in January um, so uh, in the book there's 12 chapters and um, we're going to sort of rattle through six of them today that I think give you a lot of kind of bang for your buck maybe um, but they're you know the whole point of um, of writing the book, of doing the blog, of doing the podcast, of coming and speaking at events like this is that I want people to take action. So the book is very action orientated. At the end of each chapter, there's a little suggestion for quick wins and there's a space for you to write down your own actions that you're going to take as a result of reading it. And I will invite you at the end to, um, to sort of share what action you're going to take as, um, as a result of coming today, because, you know, we all know there's no such thing as a free talk. <laughs> um, so we're not going to dwell on this a lot, but the, the problem, um, just to recap, um, I don't think we can do justice to it in uh, three paragraphs or three bullet points, but we are already seeing the consequences of one degree C um, rise in temperature. Um, and it feels really weird, doesn't it, when we talk about one degree and one and a half degrees. Like I couldn't tell you if my cup of tea was 90 degrees or um, 90.5 degrees. I couldn't tell the difference, but the planet can. And these, you know, when we're talking about one degree, one and a half degrees, it doesn't sound like much to worry about. But actually, in terms of the consequences of that, we're, you know, we're already living with that. We're seeing it in terms of um, extreme weather, rising sea levels, diminishing Arctic sea ice. Um, and the uh, Paris Climate Agreement in, in 2015, um, the agreement that came up with was that, you know, we need to limit warming to, to one and a half degrees above um, pre-industrial levels, um, industrial revolution levels, if it's, if it's so that we can 
because otherwise we're going to start to see these unprecedented changes. We're going to start to see these um, sort of runaway chains of events that, that once they've started, we've got no chance of stopping. So, you know, it's really, really important um, that, that, we, that we do that. Um, and this is all from the um, IPCC report. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I think that is. <laughs> I panic every time I say it and have to remember what it was. Um, report on global warming that came out in 2018 and um you know that just emphasized the difference between you know one and a half degrees and two degrees and the and and the differences are really quite stark really quite marked at one and a half degrees we you know it's we're going to see some change it's going to be hard but we can manage we can just about manage at one and a half degrees at two degrees we start to trigger these these sort of chains of events we start to um to really struggle as a as a society as a humanity um, so the decisions that we're taking today are really critical to ensure this safe, sustainable world for everybody, you know, and, and in that IPCC report, they talked about, um, you know, we have until 2030, really, that's the cutoff point, you know, we need to be um, really have made some significant progress by that. And they talk about these, you know, that, that we in there, I think the phrase that came out is we need to take unprecedented action. And I think as an individual, that can feel quite daunting, can't it? Like, I don't know, I would like what what is this unprecedented action I need to do? It sounds it sounds really quite big, but actually unprecedented just means something you haven't done before. So all it means is that we need to start making some tweaks and maybe doing some things that we're already doing, but in different ways. So it's not as scary and daunting as it as it might seem, hopefully. Um and the solution, I, you know, the solution is us. Um, yes, it's government. Yes, it's big business, but it's us as individuals. Um, there's this brilliant quote from um, Dr. Jane Goodall, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Now, again, that's not saying that every decision you want you make has to be like this. Oh, my God, am I being positive or negative? And uh, but, you know, if we can make more decisions that have a positive impact on the planet more of the time, that's amazing. That's what we're aiming for. And remember, this whole argument about is it is it the role of governments to, to take this action? Is it the role of big business to take the lead on this? Is it should it really all be on the individuals? No, of course it shouldn't. But um, politicians are individuals. CEOs of businesses are individuals. Imagine the changes that we would see if every single one of them stood up in their work life and their personal life and said, this is the priority. This is the defining moment of our humanity. We need to take action on this. And I'm going to make sure that my business, my government, my legacy is that, you know, um, this, that we make these changes that we need to. So, um, you know, and, and I think there's a there's a quote, I think, at the end of this presentation, like imagine if eight billion of us believed we could make a difference like that. For me, that just feels really powerful. Um, so sustainable ish. Um, I love the ish. I think the word sustainable and sustainability needs some kind of makeover. It sounds really dull, really worthy. Um, but when we add that and, and it sounds like we've got to be these kind of perfectly green people who are, um, I don't know, some of those green stereotypes we might have about, you know, needing to, to live off grid and in a yurt and knit our own yogurt from lentils and all that kind of thing. And actually, as soon as we add the ish on the end, it's like, oh, okay, maybe I could, maybe I could do that. It allows me some wiggle room. It means that um, my sort of, you know, definition of it, if you like, is that we're making the best choices that we can that work for us, that work for our families and that work for the planet and accept that for each family, for each individual, that might be different and that's okay because we're all starting from different places. We all have different circumstances and challenges that mean that maybe our really hard is somebody else's easy, maybe and vice versa. And that is absolutely okay. And we're aiming for progress over perfection all the time. And we focus on the things that we can change and not the things that we can't. And I think that's really important, especially at the moment. I speak to a lot of people um who talk about you know lockdown guilt almost in terms of um in terms of um the especially in terms of single-use plastics and food packaging and things because um you know we're not having the the choice that we would have had at the start of this year people maybe had got into a routine of going to their zero waste shop and refilling and all that sort of thing um but they, they can't do that now and we're maybe limited in the choices that we've got in the supermarkets and do you know what that's okay at the moment like that's that's out of our control that's something we can't change at the moment let's not feel guilty about that let's pivot and let's 
put our attention on some of the things that we can change from our sofas, from our homes during lockdown. And we really need to embrace this fact that no change is too small. So I think one of the things that puts a lot of people off starting is thinking, oh God, well, you know, I get the, I've got a car, I drive the car to work or to school, like that's, that's not green, I can't, well, I can't do anything, or I can't, um, do you know, but actually we just need to make a start. We just need to pick the smallest thing, the low hanging fruit and make a start with that. So these two images on the um, right hand side here, one is this, I think that very often we have this perception that being green means um, it's this kind of hierarchy of, um, of greenness. So we're starting at the bottom with this palest of pale greens and, um, and then we're working our way up to be uber crunchy greenest of all the green people. Um, and it's a very linear process. And obviously it's not, it's much more like this bottom picture where we're different shades of green um, in different areas of our life. We're different shades of green on different days of the week. We're different shades of green in lockdown to not in lockdown. We're different shades of the green of green when the kids are being really annoying. Like, and that's and that is absolutely okay. And we can move between all these different shades of green. That is absolutely um, you know, it's it's the fact that we're doing something with intention and we're looking to make a difference. So I said that I was gonna uh, rattle through um, six um, six of the chapters of the book. And the first one is conscious consumption. And this stat there um, that 60% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions are a result of household consumption. So the things that we're buying um, you know, every day, the food that we're eating, how we're traveling, how we holiday. Um, and I really had to check this stat because it sounds bonkers, doesn't it? Um, but when you include everything that we consume, you know, the, how we heat our houses, all those kinds of things, then, um, it is true it was a proper you know bona fide scientific um stat and actually better educated households have higher consumption levels generally um and therefore more emissions so just because we're kind of maybe we're more aware of um the th of things that are going on and stuff doesn't doesn't necessarily correlate that that you would be greener if you're better educated. Um, generally, it's the other way around because you have maybe you have more disposable income and therefore higher consumption levels. So the real key factor, and this is what you know, um, sorry, um, you know, capitalism in inverted commas doesn't want us to, to to cotton on to is that we all need to be buying less. And I think that's um, you know during lockdown, I think we've we've maybe had that that realization that because a lot of the maybe habitual buying we were doing. So maybe if we would go and window shop during our lunch hour and see a t-shirt or we'd, you know, I know that uh, we're just popping to the shops less. Um, so, uh, you know, we probably, fingers crossed, have all been consuming a little bit less unless it's online um, during lockdown. And maybe we've realized that it's not that hard. You know, maybe we haven't bought any clothes for three months and we're like, wow, that's amazing. And actually I'm not really missing it at all. So, you know, maybe there are some positives that will come out of what has been a really difficult and tragic time. This diagram on the, um, on the left is one of my absolute um, favorites and by a brilliant, brilliant woman called Sarah Lazarovich, who's Canadian. Um, and it's and it's a, um, a sort of take on Maslow's hierarchy of needs called the hierarchy of needs. And the idea is that you, um, you know, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. So starting at the bottom with using what you have. And in there, I would encompass things like repairing and reuse and um, reusing things, you know, upcycling. Um, because the most sustainable version of anything is the one that you've already got. So um, uh, instead of, you know, going oh I've got a reusable plastic water bottle but maybe maybe you know I'm hearing all this stuff that that plastic isn't that great so rushing out to buy a stainless steel one because that's the latest thing that they're saying is is green but actually if we just stuck with that like we've got a drawer full of really tatty looking Tupperware but it and it's plastic yeah but it's not single use plastic and it makes no sense at all at all for us to dump that and replace it with beautiful glass or stainless steel jars and things like that so it is really important that we that we use what we already have because I think you know we live in this society where we where we just we buy stuff that's our reaction to things that's our reaction to Christmas and birthdays and um but also if we start a new hobby or we start a new job we go and we buy all the kit we need or we buy some new clothes for our new job and so obviously if we want to start being green what well, we need to go and buy stuff to do that but actually and it's quite hard to resist that and and the reverse of that is true um so use what you already have um borrow 
borrowing and swapping and thrifting are all a bit more difficult to do at the moment um, because we're in lockdown. But hopefully as restrictions start to ease, that will start to become much easier. There are some really interesting um, innovative projects um, around the country. Um, so in Edinburgh, there's uh, the Edinburgh Tool Library, which is a library for tools. So you join up and you um, and you pay your membership and you can you can borrow tools rather than books, use them to put that hole in the wall or whatever it is that you need to do. And then you can give it back to them. And so you're not having to take up all that space in your own home. And you're not, you know, instead of having 40 drills per community, you can have one drill per community. I think there's a statistic that the average drill is used for um, 13 minutes in its lifetime or something crazy like that. Um, the, uh, there's also in London, there's the Library of Things in Crystal Palace, and I know that they're branching out to other places. Bath is just opening their first um, share shop. I live not too far from Froome in Somerset, and they were the first share shop in the country. So all these really interesting, like I said, innovative projects. Um, swapping can be really good. There's um, swishing is the technical term for clothes swapping. Um, you know, you can have like little swishing parties with your friends to swap your clothes once we're not in lockdown. Um, so all these things are keeping resources in, in use for as long as possible. And that's really, really important. Shopping secondhand, you know, having spent a year buying nothing new is one of my very favorite things to do. And it doesn't just have to mean trawling the charity shops, which I know we can't do at the moment anyway, but, you know, eBay, pre-loved, Gumtree, all those sorts of things. And also, you know, have a look, see if um, the Free Cycle and Free Girl are these online communities that facilitate um, sharing of resources and things between local people. So have a look, join your local one of them. Um, Making, um, I sometimes be, feel a bit worried saying that because I feel like people are going to be like, what are you on about? Who has the time to make anything now? But maybe, you know, I think in lockdown, a lot of us have been able to slow down a lot. And maybe we have, um, you know, making is having a real resurgence over the last few years. And obviously, when you make your own stuff, you know that there are no sweatshop conditions because you've got your cup of tea and, you know, you're hopefully going for a loo break when you need it. Um, so you're kind of sidestepping that quite nicely. Um, and then at the very top is buying and buying new. And I'm not saying, you know, you can never buy anything new again. We certainly do. You know, now we're not constrained by these rules of our year buying nothing new. But when we do, it's a very much more conscious decision. And we've, um, you know, worked our way through that hierarchy to establish that we can't get what we need um, with any of these other things. And then and then we'll look at, you know, um, how can we, can we buy fair trade? Can we buy organic? Can we buy locally and independent from an independent shop? All those kinds of things that really feed into that so that when we do buy, we're making, um, we're still making that buying choice a very conscious one. How am I doing for time? 25 minutes past. Um, so zero waste is another chapter in the book. And, and again, it's got the ish on the end because I personally find the concept of zero waste quite daunting, uh, quite intimidating. I wouldn't start if I knew that the expectation was that I had to be zero waste. So zero, there are lots of um, zero waste bloggers and I don't know if influencers is the right word, but people with really big followings on, on social media um, who, who are really this big zero waste community. And I don't think any of them would say that the end goal is zero waste necessarily. You know, zero waste is, so zero waste to landfill and ideally zero waste to, to, to recycling as well. That's a really big ask. Um, but I think we can all be zero waste-ish. We can all make a start reducing the amount of rubbish that we throw away because in the UK every year, we bury 18 million tonnes of waste. And I wish I had a, 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 you know, I ought to look up an equivalent for that. So we've got a really good visual for it. And it's predicted that we'll run out of landfill space by 2024. So now what's happening is a lot of our rubbish is being burnt. Um, we used to call it incineration. Now we call it um, energy from waste, um, which is quite controversial in itself. But the average person in the UK will throw away their own body weight in rubbish every seven weeks. So imagine you going in your black bin every seven weeks, basically, is how much rubbish um, is going away. And the reason that landfill is an issue is that um, when stuff goes to landfill, I think we imagine that it sits there and it all just sort of rots down nicely. And we end up maybe a bit like a compost heap. We end up with this lovely sort of soily compost at the end of it. And that's not what happens because there's not enough oxygen but there's, there's no oxygen in landfill sites and um, this the stuff kind of ferments so it starts to emit methane which is a greenhouse gas that's about 30 times more potent than than carbon dioxide so um you know we're, they're, they're contributing quite significantly to the climate crisis so 
again, another hierarchy. I never thought I'd be a hierarchy geek, but apparently I am. And this one is the waste hierarchy. So again, the idea is we start at the bottom and we think about the things that we could refuse, the things that we can do without. Um, so it might be the free little bottles of shampoo if we're ever allowed to go and stay in hotels again. Um, it might be the free balloon that someone's handing out in the street or the pens that they're giving away. You know, every time we, we take those things, we're reinforcing the message to those people giving them out that we like these things, that they're a good thing. You know, and, and, and hotel owners or chains might say, well, we can't, people love these things. They're always taking these free bottles of shampoo and things. So they love them, but actually, maybe we just do it because they're there. Um, you know, and if they weren't there, we'd all quite happily bring our own bottles of shampoo and, and use them. So, um, you know, if, if we can stop reinforcing these messages that these are the things we like, and even better, if we then use our voice to, to leave a bit of feedback with the hotel saying, um, you know, I haven't used your small bottles of shampoo because I bought my own and I'm really worried about plastic pollution and the volume of plastic that these things are putting into the environment. So that's doubling your impact. And um, can we reduce the things, um, the amount of stuff that we're buying? Because ultimately the amount of stuff, you know, the stuff that we buy does end up in the bin at some point. Um, so can we reduce, you know, in terms of clothes, there's that, you know, the whole Vivian Westwood buy less, buy better mantra. Um, so and we can probably do that in lots of areas. Um, so, uh, you know, I've got kids and uh, we have a lot of toys in the house. But one way that we've discovered of reducing the amount of toys that are coming into the house is a subscription service for toys. Um, there's a site called Whirly and um, and you sign up for a subscription and um, and then they get they pick the toys they want off the website, they get delivered, they play with them, they get bored, we send them back, they get to pick new toys. So we're getting that cycle of toys, they're getting that excitement of new toys um, without the kind of clutter and the volume and the, all these extra toys in the planet. So there are some really clever ways that you can reduce as well that doesn't have to be about deprivation and you know going without. Um, reusing is really important and we're, you know, we will um, touch on that in a minute, in, in, certainly in terms of plastics. So I, um, this isn't a scientifically proven statement, um, but you know, I think if a, a reusable item, if you remember to reuse it and you know, um, is always going to be better than a, um, a single use item. So when we're, whether we're looking at nappies, whether we're looking at plastic, you know, coffee cups, um, shopping bags, all those sorts of things. But the key really is in that you must reuse them. Otherwise there's an awful lot of resources in there for something that's essentially a single or a two use item. And um, rehoming things is talking about, um, you know, uh, donating things to other people when you're done with them. So, um, and, and I just want to say a word on that, that um, I think probably lots of us have been having a clear out during um, lockdown. And I, I'm really worried that the charity shops are going to be really inundated when they open again. Um, so have a look and see if there are other ways that you can rehome things. I know um, Freegal um, stopped um, people um, sharing stuff via their site when we were sort of peak lockdown, but they've now opened up again. So you can list your things there on Freegal to people within your local community. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to um, pass on some stuff that way. I've seen people near us just have tables on the, on the, de on the drive, you know, help yourself, take what you want. And um, because, um, certainly with clothes, um, I'd, I'd be interested to see what the stats are for other things, but with charity shops and clothes, only about 10 to 30% of the stuff that's donated is actually sold on within the UK our perception is that we donate this stuff to the charity shop we're doing that you know we're helping them to raise money we feel really good about it but a lot of the time we're just passing on the problem to somebody else so they have to um you know sort through it all and dump anything that can't be sold on um, and a lot of textiles get sold on into the secondhand textile market which is worth billions and billions of pounds and um, so all these textiles are you know crisscrossing the globe and they're actually um, now overwhelming the developing nations where they're where they're ending up. And there was a video by ITV last at the end of last year that just showed these mountains and mountains of um, rotting textiles because they've just they've got no market for it anymore. It's just swamped and saturated. So the whole time when we're looking to rehome, if we can, you know, physically make sure that's being passed on to somebody else. So, you know, share on your Facebook, say, I've got this. Does anybody want it? There's loads of Facebook swap groups and things like that. So, um, you know, let's not just use charity shops as a kind of panacea for our own overconsumption. Let's look at lower down the pyramid, see what we can do, um, and then really try and rehome responsibly. Um, I'm a massive fan of repair, having never really repaired anything until we did our year buying nothing new. Um, and again, once once we're out of lockdown, there's brilliant organisations, brilliant um, project called the, the uh, 
uh, repair cafes um, and they will have um, pop-up events most of the time um, around the country with volunteer menders and fixers on hand who will um, uh, who will be able to help you to mend your things or will mend your things for you. So, you know, repairing things can be a really powerful way of keeping them out of landfill, keeping them in use, preventing the resources that are needed for new ones. Um, I think the really interesting thing about this, this hierarchy is that recyclers is, is almost at the very top. It's kind of a last, a last resort before landfill and rotting. Um, so, you know, I think I think for a long time we've we've thought that recycling is the is the you know we're being really uber green if we're doing our recycling. And I'm not saying don't do your recycling. Absolutely, you know, recycle as much as you can. But also, you know, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a harmless um, procedure in itself. In itself, it does take energy, and a lot of the time things are downcycled. So. Um, I think we will commonly our perception will be that plastic bottles will be go and be made into more plastic bottles, whereas they're probably being downcycled into things like park benches and stuff like that. Um, so and actually, you know, if we could reduce the volume of plastic bottles going into that recycling um, loop, that would be even better. And then rot at the top is sort of landfill, but it's also composting and things like that. So if you've got curbside food waste collection, please, please, please do use it. Um, you know, if you've got your own compost, that's brilliant. And it's always going to be better than landfill because it's a much slower process. There's oxygen in it. It's releasing. Yes, it's releasing carbon dioxide, but that's better than methane. Um, so that's a quick rattle on. Plastic is a really, really big one. And, and I think it's um, it really caught the imagination, didn't it? And, and has continued to, to catch the imagination. Um, the problem isn't necessarily plastic itself, it's how we use plastic. Um, plastic is a really versatile, really strong, really durable um, material, but the fact that we then use this really strong, really durable material for something that's gonna be used for sometimes just seconds is completely bonkers. So over the last 10 years, we've produced more plastic than over the whole of the 20th century. Almost half of all plastic produced is used just once and then it's thrown away. So it's single use plastic. And unless it's been incinerated, every single piece of plastic ever made is still in existence. And of that plastic, 7 million tonnes of it ends up in the oceans each year. So the, the, the little diagram on the right there is the big four. Um, and those are the sort of probably most commonly used single use plastics. Um, and they're really, you know, if you're just thinking, oh, my God, I really want to tackle plastic. Where do I even start? Start with these four. Um, yes, it feels very different at the moment because we're probably, you know, we're not out and about as much. So we're, we're not using as many single use coffee cups. We're not sort of just popping into the shop for a bottle of water. But let's use this time to think about the strategies that we can put in place to make sure that when, when we're up, we're as lockdown continues to ease, hopefully, that we can, um, you know, make sure that we're not um, going back to those single use products. And I know that there's going to be a big push from the coffee shops to go back to disposables for um, alleged hygiene reasons. I haven't seen any evidence that suggests, um, you know, that uh, using a disposable cup is any safer in terms of virus transmission than using a reusable one. And there's a charity called City to See who have got a brilliant video of how to do contactless coffee with your reusable um, coffee cup. So if you're interested in that, do, do have a little look on, online and try and find that. Um, and then with all of these things, it's, it's a lot of it is about habits and about how we can um, just make taking these reusable things with us a habit. So for shopping bags, uh, you know, I was really good at putting my shopping bags back in the um, in the car after we'd done our shopping, um, but really rubbish at doing that whole thing of like popping in for a pint of milk and then being that person, because you never just get a pint of milk, do you? So then I was that person juggling at the checkout with all the things and refusing to take a bag. Um, but now, you know, I have a, one of those fold up bags in my handbag, in my backpack, in the car, um, so that I'm kind of giving myself as much chance as possible to never be without one. And somebody else suggested, um, having one of those ones that you can clip onto your keys so you literally don't leave the house without one. So think about how you can make it as easy as possible for yourself to remember these things and get into some nice new habits. All right, we've got 10 minutes. We're all right. We're on target, I think. Um, food. When we think about sustainable food, maybe one of the first things that we think about is that, um, you know, going vegan. Um, and yes, we all need to be eating more plants. We all need to be eating less meat. Um, food production you know is a big part of our of our global carbon footprint and of our individual carbon footprint it's responsible for a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions but um and whilst going vegan is a um is a big step like i'm not vegan um 
it's you know it's a big ask for a lot of us to do that and um, requires you know really significant investment in um, in research and lifestyle changes and all that sort of thing and for a lot of us um, maybe that feels a little bit out of out of reach but actually food waste is a huge issue and I think we can all tackle food waste pretty easily from our homes even from our sofas so if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the USA and China. And this uh, statistic here that half of all food waste occurs in the home. Again, I really had to check that because I think we're, um, when we think about food waste, I don't know if any of you watched Hugh Fernley Whittingstall's War on Waste and we see those big piles of parsnips or potatoes that are rejected by the uh, supermarkets and we are oh, bloody supermarkets you know causing a lot of food waste and things but actually you know half of all food waste occurs in the home that blows me away and it's quite um it's uh, but I think that's a really powerful statistic because actually you know if half of all food waste occurs in the home and food waste has this big impact on the climate crisis gosh, we can, we can take charge of that. We can really make a difference. We can really choose to concentrate on food waste at home without these necessarily, you know, big lifestyle jumps and switches and things like that. So um, I think a lot of us have got, you know, food waste initially went up during lockdown because of stockpiling, but I think it's really come, come down now and is lower than it was pre-lockdown because we're all getting a bit more savvy about using up the food that we've already got. We don't want to be popping into the supermarket every day. Um, and, um, you know, I think more and more people are meal planning, which is a really, really useful thing to do. You know, check what you've got in your um, in your cupboards, in your fridge, in your freezer before you go. There's an app um, called Cozo, which is C-O-Z-Z-O, um, that allows you to keep like a digital inventory of everything that's in your um, in your cupboards and in your fridge and things. And I think it kind of comes into its own when you so you can do things like if you've made a spaghetti bolognese or something and you've got um leftovers and you put them in a tupperware pot and you know mine time to get sort of shoved to the back of the fridge and then forgotten about whereas if you before you put it in the fridge take a little picture of it on the app type in a use by date of two days time and it will send you a reminder when it needs eating up so some really easy things like that or have um i know someone else who has an eat me first box in her fridge so everything that needs using up and is coming up to its date goes in there um but again you know with best before dates i probably not supposed to say well I think best bit four dates you're really safe to ignore um they are just literally that is when it will be at its best um uh use by dates you have to be a little bit more careful about but you know use your common sense if you're not immunosuppressed if you're not pregnant if you're not you know ill for any other reason um do you know have a little sniff have a little taste if it smells okay taste it if it tastes okay you know, have a little, you're probably okay. I'm pretty lax about use by dates, I have to say, especially with things like yogurt and cream and milk. Um, so yeah, I think food waste is a massive thing that we can all um, really, really work on quite easily. At home, okay, the one thing I would love everybody to do as a result of um, sitting and spending an hour with us today is to switch your energy supplier to renewable energy. Um, uh, the energy we use in our homes accounts for around 28% of all the energy used in the UK. So you know, not an insignificant amount because we probably think, oh, it's industry or it's business, but we're more than a quarter of that. So by switching to a renewable tariff, um, these are stats from Bill Bulb, they reckon you could slash your carbon footprint by up to a quarter if you go for renewable electricity and carbon offset gas. It has a higher impact, positive impact on the planet than going vegan and it's done in 10 minutes, it's done. And it will probably save you money and, and it will take less than 10 minutes. And, and as it says here, once it's done, it's done and you just sit back and be smug and watch Netflix or whatever. Um, so there's a website called um, Big Clean Switch, which is an energy comparison website um, that um, you know has done the hard work to make sure that you're not being greenwashed and you can just grab a, a recent bill um, go online, enter your details, um, use a recent bill so you get a reasonably accurate quote, um, and they will give you a variety of suggestions. And, you know, if you want the greenest of green and um, you're not on a really tight budget, then um, ecotricity and good energy are the, the sort of um, top of the league in terms of greenness in the UK. Um, and, the, and then it will give you lots of other suggestions as well that, um, you know, are still going to be have a really, really high impact in terms of switching. And as I said, it will probably save you money. I did a campaign to get people to switch in September last year. 
and one person saved 300 pounds on what she was already what she was previously spending so you know that is my key um takeaway i would absolutely love loads of you to say at the end in the comments that that's one of the things that you're going to do because can you imagine um you know not only are we saving all that energy um you know we're we're um, reducing our own carbon emissions but we're kind of putting that message out there to to the energy um the energy market that this is what we want we want more renewables and then we can double that impact again by saying to the people that we're moving away from maybe it's one of the big six and saying um just thought you'd like to know i'm, I'm moving i'm choosing to give my money to these other people because um, i love what they're doing and i really want to support renewables like this is this is some really easy ways we're going to talk about activism in a minute that you can really spread the ripples of that one act so here yeah everyday activism i think when lots of us hear about um, uh, when we hear the phrase activism or the term activism, we think about Extinction Rebellion, we think about the climate strikes, we think about people gluing themselves to bridges. And that absolutely is one kind of activism. And it has done a huge amount to raise the profile of uh, the climate crisis and to really get governments um, and businesses and individuals as well sitting up and, and taking notice and thinking that maybe we need to start taking some action. Um, but I know that for a lot of us, that kind of activism um, feels a bit much it feels you know a long way out of our comfort zones and uh, you know we are at a point where we do need to come out of our comfort zones and um, but just maybe if you're not quite at a point where you want to go and um, march and obviously we can't at the moment I really firmly believe that we all have the potential to be activists every single day I love all of these quotes on here. Um, and this, this one by Anna Lappe, every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world that you want. That is so powerful. That one, you know, I think about that. I, I would encourage you to keep that in your purse or your wallet, tattoo it to your forehead. Um, you know, it, it really makes you think when you are spending money. My husband and I would have this ongoing debate about, uh, about milk and um, I would always buy the organic milk and he would buy the non-organic because he was like, well, you know, I, it, I don't think, really think it's any better for the kids. And I was like, I'm not saying I think it's any better for the kids. No, I think it is. Um, I'm saying that I, I think the organic system is better, um, is kinder to the planet and I want to see more organics. Can you hear that screaming? I've asked them to keep quiet. I hope you can't hear that. Um, I've asked that, um, <laughs> I've asked them, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm putting that message out there to the world that I want um, more organics. Um, so, you know, you're literally casting a vote. Um, and this one by Howard Zinn, we don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to participate in change. Small acts when multiplied by millions of people can transform the world. Um, and obviously we couldn't have a, a, a section on activism without Greta. We proved that it does matter what you do and no one is too small to make a difference. So, you know, the, 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 how we spend our money, how we, how we choose to not spend our money, these are all really, really powerful actions. So, you know, we can, we can make different choices when we spend our money. We can um, share the changes that we're making on social media. I think that's really, really important. We can start having these conversations um, more openly um, you know, if we're sharing the changes that we're making on social media, that allows other people to see like, oh, oh, wow, she's done that. And, and she says it wasn't too hard. And I didn't think she was a greenie. Like, so maybe I could do that too. So we're getting these messages from lots of different areas and maybe from people that we might not have expected to get them from. And that kind of makes them much more powerful. Um, you know, you can write to your MP. There was um, some data in 2017 that showed that the reasons more MPs weren't taking action on the climate crisis was because they weren't hearing it was an issue from their constituents. And I'm sure that has now changed in, in response to the, um, the climate strikes and all those sorts of things. But, you know, we, we can, there's a, um, a bill coming up in Parliament, I think, about renewable energies. You know, we can tweet our MP. It just has to be a tweet and say, this bill's coming up, really want to know how you're voting on it because renewable energy is really important to me as one of your constituents. Um, do you know, we can do things like that. We can vote. Um, we can move our money. Um, we can we can move our money. Uh, we can move our pensions out of um, you know um, fossil fuels and those kinds of investments, and we can um, make sure that they're supporting the kind of world that we really really want. Um, right. So do one thing. I don't know if you are able to share it in the chat, but this quote, like I said, imagine if eight billion people believed that what they did could make a difference. So what is the one thing? It only has to be one thing. I don't care how small it is, how, whether you're worried that everyone's gonna be doing really bigger things, I don't care. I just want you to do one thing to make a start, to make one small change um, as a result of coming and, and giving up an hour to spend with us on a, on a Sunday morning. So 
please do share that with the chat. I don't know if I've got one more slide. Yeah, hit me up with your questions. If anybody does want to, um, to get in touch, there's my, my social media, um, my email, anything like that. But yeah, let's, let's see if we've got any questions. I know that was a big rattle through at speed. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Jen. Let me share a few questions uh, that yeah. came in over the Q&A. First of all, though, thanks for this impassionate uh, plea to all have us do something that makes a difference. Uh, one of the questions actually that came in was really regarding the last set of uh, you know, points that you've made, where you said, yeah, just pick one thing and go ahead and do it. But if you had to pick one thing, you know, and several people have asked, you know, if I had to pick one or three mm. things, where, where would I need to start? So Tammy and Amelia both sort of made similar points. What are the top three that you feel like are easy to do and, and get you there a long way? Yeah, definitely switching your um, energy supplier. I think that is the thing that can have the biggest impact. Like I said, it can slash your carbon footprint by up to a quarter from your sofa, not having to, you know, to, to make any big changes or anything like that. You can do it in an ad break. It's really super easy. So that is always my number, number one. Um, I think um, meal planning is huge as well. If you can start doing that, it, I resisted it for a long time. It feels really tedious, really grown up, really like, mm. um, but you know, and it feels like you're not gonna have any room for any spontaneity. I don't know that any of us have any spontaneity at the moment, but um, you know, you, it doesn't have to be really hard. You can put beans on toast on a meal plan. Um, just make sure you leave a couple of bits of white space for those days when you are too knackered to cook and you get a takeaway or you've got leftovers that you weren't expecting. So um, that can be really, really powerful. And I think um, moving your money, again, it sounds really dull, really tedious, really grown up. Um, and, it, and it's one of those things we have a big block over, I think, um, as, a, as certainly as a, a UK society over moving our bank accounts and things. So maybe just start if you've if you're lucky enough to have any ISAs or anything like that. Um, have a little look and see if you can move. There are more and more um, ethical and positive impact investments that you can move them into. There's a great website called Good With Money. Um, and that explains things really nicely for people like me who don't really understand lots of the um, finer details of finances. Um, but they have got loads of um, options and things on there um, to have a look at in terms of switching, you know, and start with your savings. Um, you can actually ask to move your pension as well. Um, I think most of us just assume that, you know, if we've if we've got a workplace pension, we probably tick the default box because we're, you know, it's boring and we didn't want to look into it too much. But we can ask them to move that to ethical investments as well. And there are trillions and trillions of dollars invested um, in the in the pension market. So, um, you know, if we all use that to divest from fossil fuels and, um, you know, arms and tobacco and things like that and put it towards these good things, it would have a huge impact. So there may be things that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, but I think they're really big impact things to do. Thanks for that. Now let, let me get to the really tough ones, right? So uh, one anonymous uh, participant here made the point of, uh, you know, air travel and mm. other kinds of uh, transportation. Let me talk about cars for a moment. So Jeff asked the very basic question, very important question at the same time. You know, cars, cars are major contributors uh, to climate change, right? Mm -hmm. To CO2 emissions. And actually it's not just uh, the emissions that they directly generate, it's also just making cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Global supply chains, uh, all of this sort of playing in. And even if you have a supposedly, you know, green car in a high energy efficiency mm -hmm. car, maybe an electric car, even, you know, where's the electricity coming from? Yeah. Right? It's a coal fired power plant or it's a, mm -hmm. uh, another fossil fuel fired power plant. So how do we get away from that? How do, how can a household that is car dependent, yeah. and that depends partially on, you know, where we live and how we build our cities, how can it, how can a household like that actually make a difference while owning a car? Yeah, um, and that is a, a brilliant question. And a lot of that, you know, it's so, all of these issues are so complex, unfortunately. And that's why I think, you know, we need the ish. So it's not like saying all cars are bad. Everyone needs to use public transport because, you know, I live relatively rurally. We don't have a great public transport system. I think, you know, if you're in the middle of London, at the moment, you might not want to hop on the tube, but, you know, ordinarily you, it, it's quite, feasible to, li to live without a car um, but for the vast you know for a lot of us that isn't possible now we're lucky enough you know we have an electric car we made that decision to make that investment um, 
and we have solar panels. So, do you know, we know it's, and we have, we're on a renewable energy tariff. So if you do have an electric car, even if you haven't got solar panels, switching to a renewable energy tariff means that you're charging your car from clean electricity. Therefore, it means it's pretty much zero emissions when it's running. Um, but yes, there is that big um, uh, question of, you know, the, the carbon footprint of its manufacture and things. There's a guy called um, Mike Berners-Lee who has a book called How Bad Are Bananas? And he does an awful lot of this kind of, um, life cycle stuff into like at what point you know if you've got a, a 10 15 year old diesel um at what point is it worth then um carbon wise swapping that for an electric car because there's obviously the embedded emissions and things like that so um it is really difficult i would say um and I can't remember what the stats are i would need to check but a significant proportion of the journeys that we take are under 2 miles so um, I know it's a pain when you've got kids, mine are massively resistant to this, but you know, if you can walk or cycle or take the bus for any journeys that are under two miles, that can be a really nice um, challenge. Or maybe you try and have a car free day a week. So um, instead of, uh, and that can be at the weekend if you need to use the car for work and school. Um, so that, you know, maybe instead of go, all piling in the car to go out for a day out, you do go by train, which sometimes the kids find quite exciting, or you have a day, you know, we've all had to explore our local area more and realise that maybe we don't constantly need to be visiting National Trust places and all these other places, we can have some quite nice walks and things from home or go for a bike ride or something. So again, these, these sort of small steps, it's not a, a complete solution. I don't think, you know, um, as individuals, we can, um, you know, we need lots of infrastructure changes and all those sorts of things, but there are lots of ways that we can use our cars less. And actually when we're using our cars, we can use them more efficiently as well. So those, you know, there's a thing on the AA, I think about, you know, checking your tires, uh, the right um, inflation, um, not avoiding sudden braking and things like that. Taking your roof boxes off, that can be a big, um, a big one as well. So there are ways you can have an impact. So let me let me get back to sort of a global picture here as well. Um, many of the environmental damages that we create by uh, uh, the consumption that we have also leads to you know social damages, right? Mm -hmm. Disenfranchisement of entire communities mm. in some countries. Even and Iki makes that point in one of her questions. Uh, you know, it's directly correlated. You know, to sweat labor. You know, yeah. uh, sweatshops, child labor. Mm. Um, and so there is a there are some correlation to some extent at least in, in, in those two. And so you know if we do right by the environment, in many instances we may also do right uh, by you know the people uh, who who produce those goods and services. And then there was a really interesting point uh, that one of the uh, contributors uh, to, to our chat here or to the Q and A made is all right. So if we were to reduce our consumption of products that come from these countries. Obviously, that has a negative impact mm. on their economies. How do we resolve sort of our development agenda with the consumption agenda? How do we reconcile those two? God, you're asking me really hard questions. I was wondering, <laughs> yeah, I was expecting, really, you know, like, what's, the, what's your favorite brand of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> um, the you know, these are huge questions. And I think it's a question that comes up around sustainable fashion a lot in that, um, you know, we have these sweatshops and um, we will have child labor some of the time. Um, but one, some people will say, well, hold on, if we're not buying from fast fashion chains, these people will be out of a job. But actually, you know, that's what we need is the fast fashion chains to up their game, to start paying these people a fair, wage um, to start making sure that the conditions are safe for them to work in so that they still have that job but they're being paid more and they're working in safe conditions so there are lots and lots of layers of complexity um, I think you know this is the whole um, in America they're pushing for this green new deal and I've heard it being talked about here and certainly in terms of you know a green recovery from um, economic recovery from the coronavirus impact and um, so um, so we may end up having less jobs in some areas, um, in some areas of the economy, not necessarily geographically, but actually there, it's not that there will be less, there, there may end up being more jobs overall because a lot of these green jobs and you know developing all this green infrastructure. And um, so maybe we're looking at people repairing things rather than making new things and all those. So 
you know, it is a big shift. And what we're what we want to be aiming for is this circular economy so that we've got instead of at the moment, we've got this very linear economy where things are made and they're used and they're dumped. And those all those resources just sit there and go to waste. So what we want is economies whereby things are things are made, things are used, the, the, the materials get harvested or used again, made back into the same thing. And this can just continue around this same loop. Um, there's um, a great book, which I have to confess to not having read, um, but I have it on my shelf waiting to be read, um, called Donut Economics by an, eco an econo economist called Kate Rayworth. And, um, and that's all about that and how we, you know, we really do need to shift to this much more circular system. And hopefully, um, you know, we, whilst we're doing that, we can incorporate a much fairer system into that as well. So let me uh, close with another one of the tough questions. Oh, no. so, <laughs> this is great. I mean, look, we're all here to pick your brain, right? Um, you made the point uh, somewhat in passing that as we reduce our waste consumption uh, or the waste generation, as we reduce our consumption, we're saving money, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is income that doesn't get uh, put towards things that ultimately get put into a landfill. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do with that money? Um. There's a, <laughs> there's a um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he wrote a book called Stuffocation and he talks about um, the rise of the, um, the sort of experience economy. And I think that, um, you know, to make the, one of these sweeping generalizations, apparently millennials are much more into this. So they're much more into spending their money on going out for a meal with their friends or, um, you know, spending a weekend away together. Um, hopefully locally and not flying um do you know and actually doing things together rather than um everything being about the stuff and the things and i talk about this a lot at christmas as well that um you know i think uh, certainly our children become overwhelmed with all this stuff and actually a really good suggestion for grandparents and things is to you know can you take them off each one-on-one -on -one and have a day out with them so you know we'll be looking like i said it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily be um less consumption consumption of overall um but it will be less stuff focused it will be more about experiences and things we can do together spending time together and um do you know i think and i also think we need to let go of this idea that the only way we can measure um success is this you know is gdp and this continue because we can't continue to grow on a planet of finite resources so we need to work out much more circular ways much much better ways of keeping money in in flow and where it needs to go but without all the resources that are needed to be used so it's all about quality right quality of life quality of the environment yeah quality of the relationships that we have and uh not the stuff that yeah and i think you know have. hopefully you know that's maybe one of the things that will come out of lockdown is that we're realizing that um you know we've been able, we've we've had to slow down but you know people have been furloughed and things like that other people have been much much busier but those who've you know we've had to slow down we've had to stop using um buying things as a as a pastime you know going out shopping with friends and that sort of thing and um, so yeah it does it, it it does it is about slowing down and and less but not in a way that means deprivation and austerity and you know kind of flipping it so that we've got more time more um better quality relationships all those sorts of things on that upbeat note i want to thank you very very much for sharing with you the various steps that you have taken and take us with you on that journey i also want to thank uh, the audience uh, who has uh, connected with us uh, electronically and i want to make sure that you know the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, uh, which you can access uh, from the watch again section of the website. Uh, but give us a few days uh, to make sure it's on there by the time you check. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of Jen's book, The sustainable -ish Living Guide. Look at that uh, this slide. This is pro. <laughs> Pardon? It's very professional way. Eh? The slide just came up there with the book on. I like that. <laughs> so, so you can hear here's information where you can get this. Um, and then uh, we very much hope uh, to have you be part um, of the other events uh, of the uh, Festival of Ideas. Uh, check out the website uh, for the various events that are available and uh, let us know what you think uh, on, about these events and uh, continue the conversation using the hashtag York Ideas. Uh, wish you a wonderful day, everyone. And again, thanks for being part of this. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much.